Today we're going to talk about French settlement of North America and this fight that's going to break out between the French and the British for the future of North America and the results of this fight. Alright, so in order to talk about why the French are coming to the New World, we got to talk about who is France? You know, who are these people that are going to come uh, settle in today's Canada, uh, New Orleans, and a couple other areas of North America? Well, um, as we all know, French, this is a French flag, at least a modern French flag. France is this country in Europe sort of sandwiched between uh, England and Spain. So, talk about the French. We're going to sort of rewind things to around 1500 when the French are going to start uh, arriving in North America. What do we need to know about these guys? Well, one of the things we need to do before we talk about France is we sort of need to push aside some of the conceptions that we have about France in the modern day United States. Like, if you ask the average American, what do you think when you think French? There's not going to be a lot of positives to come out of it. In the United States, for a jillion different, you know, misplaced reasons, we have this impression of the French as this guy, a guy in a beret, a guy that's always carrying baguettes, that's always sticking out of a paper bag, you know, maybe a mime or something like that, a guy that's going to be rude, steal your girlfriend. And we always have this impression of the French as being people that surrender or something, you know, this impression you get from World War II, which... You know, if we had time, I could I could uh, sort of defend the French what happened in World War II. But please know that this is not the French we're talking about. I'd argue this isn't the French of modern day either. But uh, for our purposes, let's just say this isn't the France that's going to be coming to the New World in the 1500s and 1600s. All right, who is this France? Who is the France that's going to settle in Canada and Louisiana? Well... The French in the 1500s and 1600s, I want you to just know that France is kind of unified. Now, we're going to talk about how differently they're unified than Spain and England. Just know that France isn't going to be invaded by the Moors like Spain and Portugal, so it's not going to have this external threat to unite the various kingdoms uh, that uh, are in France. France had again been once part of the Roman Empire. Uh, the French had been a bunch of tiny fighting Christian kingdoms, uh, fighting one another. Uh, and in a way, France in the 1500s kind of still going to be a bunch of diverse fighting. There, there's a lot of civil wars uh, in France in the 1300s and 1400s. Um, but eventually, France will come under a single king. Uh, by the 1500s. Now, it's going to be a king that's going to be an absolute monarch like the Spanish king. He's going to have full authority. He's not going to have to be beholden to parliament in the way that England is. Um, you are going to have greater divisions. The aristocrats will be a little bit more upset at the king, things like that, But uh, than you may be seeing in Spain. But you do have a single monarch with absolute authority in in. Uh, uh, in France. Now there's going to be, the reason I don't say he's as unified, the people are going to be as unified under the king as the Spanish are unified under the Spanish king, is because there were these civil wars in 1300s and 1400s in France. And France is going to be experiencing in the 1500s these civil wars owing to this Protestant Reformation. So we talked about what happened in England. Basically, the uh, uh, English king broke away, formed the Church of England. Well, you're going to have the same conflict in France. You're going to have some French that look at the Catholic Church and say the Catholic Church is corrupt. Um, we don't think we should be beholden to the Pope. We don't think we should have to listen to this church hierarchy. And you got a lot of people that want to break away from the Catholic Church. They still want to remain Christians, but they don't believe the Catholic Church is the truth path to God. So what you're going to see in the 1500s and 1600s is the emergence of Protestantism. Now, the Protestants are going to be outnumbered by the Catholics throughout French history, but there will be civil wars breaking out between um, the Protestants of France and the Catholics. Again, the Catholics are going to merge victorious, this is in part because the French kings are going to support the Catholic Church, but there will be a lot of violence, um, a lot of bloodshed. This, for example, is a uh, painting of uh, uh, an incident between a Catholics in one town and uh, Protestants in the town. 
I believe if I remember correctly, this this might be painted after the incident uh, in which the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones was uh, uh, was based on. Basically, there was a, a um, wedding. Uh, one of the families turned on the other family because of religious reasons, and people just started getting killed left and right. Um, so very similar to the Red Wedding, Game of Thrones. Spoiler alert. So anyway, you have this Protestants in, uh, in France, although they're a minority, and they're not going to take over like they are in England. France will be Catholic, although not uber catholic like spain because they didn't go through the recon key so they didn't get those close ties with the catholic church that spain sort of had to get to get support uh to fight back against the moors so france is catholic but not uber catholic and there are some protestants within france uh, another thing you should know about france is that it's got more fertile land than spain roughly the same size as Spain, uh, but more fertile land, which means you, it can support a greater population than Spain, and it can also support a much greater population than England. So around the time period we're talking about uh, 1500s, maybe by the mid-1600s, France is going to have about a, a population of about 20 million. You can compare this to Spain at about 7 million, uh, England at 5 million. So it's got a large population, all right? It's got a large population, and this is going to serve France well because throughout much of the time period we're going to be talking about, when you're talking about armies, a lot of what matters in armies is how many men you can put on the field. France can put a lot of men on the field. So uh, what we'll see consistently through the history, Spain's going to have the money coming in because of all the new world wealth, and they're going to be spending this left and right. England has sort of the mercantilism, and they're going to get to the point where they develop not just a commercial navy, but they'll uh, eventually develop a military navy um, uh, that's going to be superior to just about any others. Uh, but France is almost always going to have the superior army, in part because uh, they have such a large population. They're also going to have a big, tough army because France has to deal with a bunch of enemies. So Spain... Sure, you've got Portugal, but Portugal's sort of this frenemy. Uh, you know, they'll be uh, fighting between Portugal and Spain, but it's not going to be as uh, often as you see Spain and France, for example, getting into fights. They'll get in fights over territory in these Pyrenees Mountains. France is always going to have to deal with these smaller kingdoms that aren't listed on this map. Later on, you're going to see this Austria unified. Um, not in our class, but later on, you'll see Germany unified. And basically, these other Christian nations, uh, and then later on, you know, unified nations will uh, constantly be threatening France's borders. So in order to defend its borders, France is going to have to uh, militarize. So think of the French as having a tough army. And it's not just a tough, big army. It's probably going to be the best trained army in the world. Because something about France is going to differ from the Spanish and, to an extent, the English is the French are going to be going through 1500s and extending into the 1600s, sort of this renaissance that you're not going to see as much in Spain or England. Basically in the 1500s, this is something we're not going to talk about, but in the 1500s, Italy goes through this renaissance, and basically it means this revival of uh, studying the ancient documents. So as we talked about, during the Roman Empire, you had tons of science develop, you had... Uh, you know, literature, art, just this, uh, you know, all this stuff being produced under the Romans. Well, during the medieval ages, dark ages, whatever you want to call them, you hadn't seen as prolific of works of art. Again, sorry, medieval historians, but but you simply haven't. Um, but what we're going to see in the 1500s in Italy is a lot of people start looking at what the ancient Romans used to do, the ancient Greeks used to do, and they're going to start reproducing these arts, the sciences. They're going to start looking back at these old ancient scientists and basically saying, you know, what can we learn from them? Well, this is going to put Italy, you know, sort of in this uh, position to, you know, develop new technologies, new art, new sciences, as they recreate what the old ones did and then expand upon them. Well, being adjacent to Italy... Uh, we're going to see this renaissance really take hold in France. And what the French will do more so than the Spanish or the English is they're going to start to expand upon their scientific thinking and they're going to start using science to develop better ways to use, you know, to develop art. They're going to start uh, making advances in literature. And in ways they're going to use science to create 
better ways of making war, okay? The French go through this renaissance and become uh, essentially at the forefront of art military thought, all right? So in general, French soldiers throughout this time period are going to be talking about, you know, uh, especially 1600s and especially 1700s, uh, are going to be the best trained soldiers in the world. So they're going to have the biggest army in the world, best trained soldiers in the world. And in part, this goes back to these French thinkers saying, you know, how can we train our soldiers better? How can we make their our guns more efficient at fighting? How can we um, uh, get supplies to the front lines and uh, better and things like that? So when you think of France, think absolute monarchy, unified, although, you know, there is some civil wars within France or some disruptions, you know, it's uh, not as absolute authority as you see in Spain, um, but you, you do have an absolute monarchy. You have Catholicism being the dominant religion in France, although you are going to see some Protestant sects emerge in, in uh, France and Spain. That stuff is uh, cracked down upon. But in France, you'll have some Protestants. Occasionally, there'd be civil wars breaking out between the Protestants and the Catholics in France. But again, Catholic dominant, and the monarch's going to be Catholic. France has a large population and a large army, and it has a well-trained army. And again, the French are sort of at the forefront of this scientific thought, military thought, artistic thought in um, the 1600s and 1700s. All right, so that's the French. Well, what are they going to have to do with the New World? All right, well, the French, like the English, are going to be relative latecomers to the New World. So as we've talked about, the Spanish had gotten over here, 1492, and the Spanish are going to be more or less alone in settling permanent settlements for uh, the 1400s, the end of the 1400s, and the 1500s. We talked about this before. The Spanish are spreading out everywhere, building in the Caribbean, then you know, uh, taking over Indian cities and populating within uh, within Mexico, South America, places like that. They're over there by themselves. And we talked about the only Englishmen that are going to be coming over in uh, the 1500s are fishermen, pirates, maybe people that are going to go up and down the tr coast and trade with Indians. Pretty much the same story with France. England and France have a very similar history when you're talking about the New World in 1500s. The only French that are going to come over to the New World in the 1500s are people that are going to come over, be there temporarily to fish, to... Uh, trade with local uh, Indians, or to pirate the Spanish. So this isn't going to be any state-sponsored thing. Like, the king's not going to finance expeditions. There, are, I, I should point out they're going to be, well, I, I don't know if I'll mention it, but you'll, you'll uh, a handful of ex, uh, exceptions to that, some short-lived attempts at settlements down here, but the Spanish basically kick them out very quickly. But for our purposes here, the only French you're really going to see in the 1500s are these fishermen. And again, the f French and when the Spanish are at their height of their power in the 1500s, nobody wants to hang out here. So the French are going to mainly congregate up here fishing, occasionally go down here to trade with local Indians. Uh, and then you'll have the French pirates that will go down here to try to uh, you know, pirate Spanish goods. So it'll be a dude with a boat a fisherman, a merchant, something like that. I'm going to throw a cannon on it, attack the Spanish, or I'm going to go out here to get this good fish. And a lot of times you'll actually see uh, English and French um, fishermen, you know, trading in the in the same relative area sometimes, uh, you know, uh, fishing or trading in the same region. So this is going to be the pretty much the extent of the French in the 1500s. Now, you will see one particular Frenchman um, a guy named Jacques Cartier. We're not going to get to talk about him, but he's going to be a guy who's an explorer and a trader. He's going to give the French an advantage over these other powers and that he's going to be a guy in the mid-1500s, 1530s, um, who will explore this river here, this St. Lawrence River. So basically this guy, Jacques Cartier, you don't really need to know uh, much about him for our purposes, but 
He's going to go down this little inlet, the St. Lawrence River, in the hopes of finding a passage to Asia. Again, this idea of this passage to Asia is not going to go away. Even in the 1700s, or early 1800s, even, they're still, still really looking for it. Um, but Jacques Cartier thinks the St. Lawrence uh, goes to Asia. He's not going to get far down the St. Lawrence, but he's going to sort of map this out. And then when he doesn't find it, he's going to sort of be put on the wayside. You know, attempts a... Uh, you know, to, to go down the St. Lawrence, there's rapids and things like that, so he can't go past it. But besides that, very similar experience to what we had with the English. Well, uh, the French are actually going to excel in a way that, in the 1500s, in one particular area uh, of this New World business, okay? And this is going to be in harvesting the fur of this particular animal here, this beaver, okay? All right, so both the English and the French, when they come over and they trade with local Indian groups, they're going to be bringing, again, hatchets, knives. One of the things they're primarily going to be looking for, for from these trade, trade goods is beaver fur, okay? So the beaver is a wet, wet, wet water animal, okay, or a uh, cold weather animal, that lives in water, all right? And it's a mammal, so mammals are warm-blooded. Uh, and if you're a warm-blooded animal and you're in freezing water, near freezing water, that's not good. The heat's gonna escape your body and you're gonna die. You just can't, warm-blooded animals can't, can't survive if their blood freezes. Well, um, in order to adapt to this, the beaver had evolved to have this layer of fur that's incredibly soft, okay? So imagine you're bit getting dunked in ice water, uh, how bad that can be if you just have uh, skin, no hair, but if you develop tiny, tiny hairs, what that can do is that can basically trap a layer of insulation between you and the cold water. So what the beaver did is that basically over, you know, millennia, whatever, millions of years, they developed this this tiny fur to where uh, there's one million hairs per square inch of beaver fur and what these tiny uh, hairs do is they trap air and so the beaver can be submerged in near freezing water and it's going to keep the heat in their body. Well again this is fantastic if you, got, if you have to survive cold water but it's going to be bad when you know people go around looking for stuff to make coats out of or make hats out of. And this is what's going to happen in the 1500s. Basically, when the French and English start going to these colder regions, again, just to fish, but then they're going to start trading with locals. One of the things they're going to get from these locals is this beaver fur. They're going to start bringing this back to their respective nations. And when they start selling this, these elites, you know, these landed individuals or descendants of these landed individuals, uh, the people with expendable capital, which isn't a lot of people, but you know, uh, it is. It is some people. They're gonna start saying, "Man, this thing feels great. I want more of it." And basically, what happens in the mid 1500s is there's gonna be this beaver fur craze. Everybody is gonna want to make a hat or a coat or whatever out of this beaver fur. So. What we're going to get is, uh, and that's Ben Franklin, he's not going to come along till later, but that's an example of what a beaver fur hat would look like. All right, so we get this demand in France, also in England, and really throughout Europe, but, you know, it's going to be coming in through these merchants from England and France. We're going to get a lot of these elites basically paying high dollar for this animal. Well, it's going to be for these merchants who head over to this new world in the 1500s, especially the mid-1500s, they're going to make a ton of cash because all they have to do to get the beaver fur is bring over a couple hatchets, a couple knives, and you can trade these goods for a lot of animals. I don't have the exact numbers here, but let's imagine you bring 10 hatchets. That's going to cost you not very much in France, but an Indian along this coast here, that hatchet, a single, just one hatchet, is going to improve their life substantially. Uh, chopping down a tree with a metal hatchet versus a stone hatchet, which is, again, the people of the coast can't produce uh, steel, web, uh, steel uh, hatchets or anything like that, but stone versus steel chopping down a tree, you're going to save countless hours. I, I'm just making this up, but I bet it would take 10 minutes to, or not 10 minutes, 30 minutes maybe to chop down a tree uh, with a steel hatchet 
but uh, versus maybe 10 hours versus a stone hatchet. Same thing with like pots, you know, if one of these traders brings over a metal pot, you have a consistent cooking ve vessel or a pan or something like that you can reuse. You don't have to, uh, you know, set up an elaborate cooking system or something. It just saves a significant amount of time and improves your life. So when the French come over, uh, they're going to start trading these goods, and at first they're going to get a substantial profit. So, again, one hatchet, a hundred beaver fur, and then they can trade that hundred beaver fur for as much as it would take to get you know, a thousand hatchets. So basically one hatchet turns into a thousand hatchets. Again, making these numbers up, but you, you can see how that would be a substantial profit. So these first Frenchmen and English, by the way, we'll talk about that more in a second, are going to start going over here up and down this coast to get this beaver fur. Well, in the late 1500s, these fur traders are going to start to face a problem. One big problem is going to be that they're going to start having a lot more competition, not only from uh, other merchants in France, but as the beaver fur starts expanding in Europe, more and more English merchants will start showing up in the same locations where these French merchants had, had been trading. So let's say it's 1550, uh, you're a French merchant, you trade one hatchet for 100 beaver fur. Well, you come back every year, same price. Well, now, you know, let's say 1660, right after you show up, well, I'm only going to give you 10 beaver fur for one hatchet. Well, you've been giving me 100 before. Well, no, the, these English guys that show up, they, uh, they're they giving me uh, one hatchet for 10 beaver fur. So that's the going price. If you don't, If you don't want to do this deal, I'll just wait and do the deal with them when they come around next month or something like that. So now you see this competition will start driving up with the Indians' demand uh, for the beaver fur. So that's going to start cutting into profits. Not only that, but towards the end of the 1500s, what begins to happen in this traditional trading area, and beaver, you know, they're not really down here because they're, they're uh, generally cold weather animals, and again, you don't want to get close to the Spanish, uh, hang out too long because in the 1500s they're the most powerful uh, nation. But uh, up here, you know, in this area where the French traditionally are trading, they're the beaver are going to start going extinct. So even if there's not, you know, you have a place where the English haven't found yet and you're trading with uh, locals, at, over a period of time, the beaver is simply going to run out. Basically, the uh, uh, you know, animal will be driven to extinction in certain areas. Again, you know, if you're an Indian and you're seeing this guy show up, you get such an improvement in, in life with these metal weapons and the French will also trade firearms. Hold off on that in just a second. You see an advantage you can get over your neighbors. You know, if you don't trade with these guys, your neighbors will trade with them, and then they're going to get an advantage over you, so you better be the one to trade with them. Of course, you're going to be getting as many of these animals as you can, and you're not going to be thinking about 10 years down the road. You want to just get that stuff now, and you realize you have to sort of get it now, or somebody else will get it. So essentially these groups will drive these beaver to extinction along the coast here. All right, or on verge of extinction on the coast here. So by 1600 or so, the huge profits the French have been making are dramatically decreased. Well, that's where this guy's going to come in, Samuel Champlain. Samuel Champlain is a French merchant, a guy that had been dealing in the fur trade uh, in the late 1500s, uh, first years of the 1600s, he's got a good idea. He's going to look and he's going to actually read some of these old maps put together by some of the first French fishermen and traders that have been going on the Atlantic coast. And again, they've been going there for uh, 100 years by, by uh, early 1600s. Samuel Champlain is going to come across some of these maps that Jacques Cartier had drawn up about... Um, had drawn up about uh, the St. Lawrence River. So at this point, it had been 60 years since Jacques Cartier had gone uh, down this area, but he'd dr drawn these maps, and Samuel Champlain had run across the maps, and he'd seen that uh, this other Frenchman, this Cartier guy, had gone all the way down the St. Lawrence, didn't find a passage to Asia, uh, but did map out this long river going into the interior. Well, Champlain is going to have an idea. All right, he's going to say if the beaver are running... Uh, going extinct here, 
if we go down this river, we're going to be basically opening up a whole new area where the beaver have not yet gone extinct. And he's going to say, if we go down this river and we establish maybe a permanent settlement, then uh, we can trade with the locals and we can make sure English merchants don't come down here as well. So if we go into the interior, we can cut off the beaver fur trade before it reaches the coast and can be traded with the English, and we can open up new regions where the beaver has yet to go extinct. So Champlain will go to the king of Engl uh, sorry, the king of France, uh, 1607, uh, and he's going to say, "Can I have your permission to bring a couple fur traders and settle a city at the end of the St. Lawrence River?" Can I create a permanent settlement? And this is interesting because this is right around the exact same time the English are first settling down here uh, in Virginia, uh, Jamestown. So the French king will give Champlain permission, and Champlain will head over. He's actually going to uh, go over to the New World himself. And when he gets to the St. Lawrence, he's going to found Quebec in 1608. Again, this is right after Jamestown's founded. Well, Quebec is going to be different than Jamestown in that it's going to be primarily about the fur trade, at least initially. So all these French are going to do is set up this post on the St. Lawrence, and what they're going to do is they're going to wait for these ships to come in carrying French goods, and um, uh, when they get the goods, you know, hatchets, knives, pots, guns, whatever, they're going to offload them at this fort they create, this uh, tiny small fort, uh, and then they're going to wait for local Indians to bring in fur to trade for the European goods. So you just chill out. Champlain and a couple dudes uh, are just going to chill out while these Indians come in here and bring these, these furs to them. And then the French will trade them, again, hatchets, knives, whatever. So they just sort of chillax here uh, for the first couple of years, wait for the goods coming from Europe then load on the, the uh, furs to send back there. And for these for these first couple of years, this fur trade is going to be profitable again, extremely profitable again. Champlain's going to make a lot of money. King of France is going to be happy because he's going to get his share of the fur trade. And then the elites in France and the rest of Europe are happy because they're getting uh, cheaper fur now uh, again. All right, well, the problem is going to be, same thing we saw on the coast, after a couple of years, decade or so, uh, all the beaver in this area start to go extinct, which is really interesting. This is something we don't really get to talk about, but uh, there actually used to be this huge, you know, um, I don't know exactly how, how big, 30 pounds or something, uh, you know, sort of like uh, type of beaver that was uh, really big in this area. Uh, that essentially goes extinct. And what you see, by the way, imagine what the happens with the environment if you take out this animal that builds dams. When, you know where there had been lakes. Whenever the beaver go away, uh, you know now there's going to be swamps. You'll see just water levels change in certain regions. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting side side uh, environmental impact. We we're not going to get to talk about. Oh, another fun thing here, and I'm just going to go ahead and say this, but um, uh, because you're over here and a lot of people, you're getting this fur um, from these Indians, and you're also getting a lot of beaver, uh, the meat from the animal. Uh, the Catholic Church to sort of support the fur traders over here. They're going to make it. Uh, oh, they're going to classify the beaver as a fish to make it okay to eat during Lent. That's kind of a side fun fact, and that's uh, that's owing to this beaver fur trade here. But anyway, going back to um, um, so again, McDonald's. They have the fish sandwich during Catholic Lent. They maybe would have a beaver sandwich or something during uh, Lent next year. Anyway, um, but. Uh, after a decade or so, this stuff starts to go extinct here. This beaver starts to go extinct. So Champlain, he's going to remain there for, for a long time. He's going to oversee expansion westward. So, all right, well, if it's going extinct here, let's send an, an outpost down here. And the next major uh, uh, outpost that will develop is going to be Montreal. And it's going to be sort of the same thing. We wait here, local Indians. And a lot of these local Indians are actually going to be exposed to the French for the fir first time as they reach this area. Uh, we'll start bringing fur to Montreal. And for decade or whatever, uh, you're going to start seeing this um, uh, fur trade expanded down here. But same thing's going to happen with Montreal. Beaver's going to be played out. And uh, the French are going to have to move 
down. And this isn't going to be just one group. Again, this is going to be generations and generations because it's going to start in 1608, but then 16 teens, 1620s, years go by. Uh, you're going to see more and more people move in. And I should point out, after these outposts move, the previous outposts aren't going to go away. Like Quebec, when the beavers played out, now this is just going to be the place where goods are offloaded and then loaded onto small boats to bring down river. Um, you'll also see, and we'll talk about this more in a second, farmers here growing food to send to the fur traders down there. So it's basically this westward push to catch up with this animal that goes extinct wherever the French arrive. Well, the French eventually are going to hear about these great seas to the west, and they're going to proceed down here and find the Great Lakes. Once they get to the Great Lakes, again, we're talking water travels, the easiest way to get around, so you can start setting up outposts throughout these Great Lakes. And then you'll find another river to this great next set of Great Lakes. And whenever you reach these things, new outposts are going to be set up. I'm just labeling the ones that are going to become big cities today. But the way the French would do this is they reach these areas, they find Indian groups that are willing to trade, and they'll set up these small outposts. Sometimes these outposts are just going to be a couple dudes. Uh, this will be five or six guys. They find an area with a lot of beaver fur, friendly Indian groups. You build a small fort, and then you just chillax there, and you just wait until, uh, with your European goods, wait till the fur uh, comes from the locals bring the fur. Then you send the fur up, and you, you wait for the goods to come back down. You know, send a couple people back uh, to bring these goods. Sometimes these fur traders, they're going to be going so far from civilization uh, that a lot of them are just going to simply move in with the Indians. That sort of would make more sense. We'll actually see a lot of fur traders go native, is what the French would say, and start uh, adopting the Indian language, uh, marrying you know the, the chief's daughter or something like that. This is going to actually help them as businessmen because they're going to become exclusive trading partners. You know, you want to sell exclusively to your son-in-law, uh, things like that. And then a lot of French, they sort of look at this you know, as an opportunity to sort of uh, escape the restrictions of Catholicism uh, that you have back home. You can have multiple wives, that type of thing, uh, because a number of the Indian groups are going to encounter. Uh, actually, I think my, maybe all of them have poly, uh, polygamy um, as a, a, a marriage. Um, so the French keep expanding, but I don't want to give the impression that the French are densely populating this this sort of blue uh, purple region. The English, as they're settling, they're starting to densely pack this area because any land can be used to grow crops, or just about any land down here. The French are basically just a couple people, couple hundred, eventually a couple thousand, but not much more than a couple thousand because it's just these small outposts. They're not growing a heck of a lot of food, a little bit in these uh, settlements up here, but it's just a couple people hutting out, so it's not very many French, uh, and they're just setting up these small outposts. The Indians are doing a lot of the work. So this fur trade continues to expand, and we're going to see that when you compare the French relationship with these Indians they're encountering to uh, what's happening with the English settlements, for the most part, you know, the, the French uh, trade with these, these various Indian groups, it, it's going to be positive in a lot of ways okay so we talked about what happens with the English you're growing crops even the Puritans up here they're growing their crops but you know down here these cash crops you're using up the land then you start growing uh, claiming Indian hunting grounds as your land you start growing there Indians retaliate because you're taking their food then you retaliate uh, eliminate a lot more of them than they they eliminated of you then you force the survivors to sign up uh, sign over their land. Once you got that, you keep pushing the Indians west, keep pushing the Indians west, things like that. So that is what the English model is. You don't see that with the French because they're not really claiming land. They, you know, Outside of these uh, major cities up here, there's not really much agriculture. The Indians are doing most of the work themselves, and the Indians are getting something positive out of this. They're getting goods that they could not produce themselves. And a lot of these groups, especially when you get into the interior and you get to areas where it's hunter-gatherer Indians, not the sedentary agriculturalists we, we see over here, you know, they're getting exposure to different types of food than they've had before. And, and, it's, and it's almost like a win-win situation. The 
Indians are getting these goods that make their life better for this animal that was relatively useless before. You know, you get a little bit of meat from them, but now you're getting a pot. Now you're getting, you know, nice clothing. Now you're getting uh, uh, iron tools, and it's just going to be a significant improvement in your life. So, for the most part, the French interaction with these Indians is is better than the English interaction with Indians. But I don't want you to think this fur trade is completely uh, benign, because we will see the French interactions with Indians will bring some negative effects. Um, and this is going to come in the form of the thing that's always happened that we've talked about with Europeans, disease. As some of these fur traders make their way down, some will bring with them smallpox, and they're going to expose some of uh, these Indian groups in the interior where the various waves of disease had never made their way through. And, you know, you know these groups towards the coast, they're slowly building uh, immunities through, you know, d uh, dozens and dozens of, of uh, waves of death. But the first are going to be coming through with these first traders in the interior. Now, they eventually would have gotten there anyway, but um, again, you know, this is the first time they're introduced by these fur traders. Uh, fur traders are going to bring a different form of disease with them. Um, so the Spanish had certain restrictions about what can be given to Indians. They wouldn't provide them with firearms uh, with, or with alcohol. The French have no issue providing these things to Indians. So when they come in and trade, some French fur traders will bring you know, whiskey, bring uh, different types of, of alcoholic beverages, and they're going to be introducing these uh, these uh, spirits to uh, tribes that had never had, uh, some had never had agriculture before, and if you don't have a surplus of grains or anything to produce alcohol, you, you know, haven't had a time to develop the social and perhaps biological resistance to alcohol that you would see in agricultural cultures. So a lot of these groups, the French come in and they introduce alcohol, and this is going to cause devastation to these communities. Again, you know, if you've never had alcohol before, you don't know, you know, uh, tolerance, things like that. And so what we'll see is, you know, once alcohol is introduced, uh, families will get destroyed, things like that. People will drink themselves to death. I mean, it's truly devastating. Eventually, the French are going to make it illegal uh, to trade alcohol to these Indians. But if you're talking about a fur trader on the frontier, far from French authorities, they, a lot of times they're not really going to listen to that. So uh, uh, this is sort of a factor that comes along with this French fur trade. Another thing, again, that the French are going to trade that we don't see the um, uh, Spanish trade and the English are going to limit it somewhat, but, th but they're going to trade them as well. But what the French are going to trade to Indians is firearms. Basically, you bring us beaver fur, we'll, we'll give you firearms. Um, and so what you're going to see is some of these groups that are adjacent to the French will manage to get advantages over their neighbors. So if the French come in, you're one of the first groups to start trading beaver with them, you're going to get firearms, you're going to get knives, you're going to get these things that your neighbors don't have. And what will then happen is the beaver in your area start to run out. Well, I have guns, my neighbor doesn't, he still has beaver in her, his area, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my guns, my knives, my military advantage to take them over. And that's what's depicted here. This guy's an Iroquois warrior. Um, these are one of the first groups to trade with uh, the French. They get these weapons, their neighbors don't, and when they start running out of their weapons, uh, or running out of their beaver fur, they're going to start expanding. So the Iroquois go from relatively smaller tribe to start expanding, taking over their neighbors to acquire beaver to trade with the French. They don't want to lose the advantage by you know allowing their neighbors to get weapons from the French while uh, while while they don't happen have them and essentially what happens is almost like an arms race you introduce this uh, superior weapon uh, to these Indian groups and those who have them can take over those who do not and so this is going to be a problem that's going to come along with this French fur trade okay um, again you know it won't just be the Iroquois you'll see other pockets of these strong groups that, that acquire these weapons through um, uh, through the French. Alright, so that's 
going to be the main push of French expansion in the 1680s. Again, you know, down here in the English colony, we have agriculture pushing inwards. That's a good push here. You know, got a lot of Puritans arriving up here. But uh, that's what's leading to expansion up here. Up here, it's the, the fur trade. And again, as we mentioned, the French aren't coming in nearly the numbers that the English are because there's only a finite amount of beaver. And you only need a, a couple people uh, to set up these posts to allow for the Indians to bring the fur to you. So I want to point out, though, it's not exclusively fur traders. They're going to be coming down uh, to the Great Lakes and some of these setting up outposts in the area that's going to be uh, the United States. We will see a handful of French missionaries that are going to arrive as well. Now, these French missionaries, just like Spanish missionaries who are doing in northern Mexico, you know, and settling among the Pueblos and trying missions in Florida, their whole deal is to spread Catholicism. What they want to do is they want to go among an Indian group, convert the uh, local Indians to Christianity, uh, have them start becoming more French-like, speaking the French language, with the hope that, you know, after a couple years, uh, you once you had a pagan that could probably be considered an enemy, but now he's somebody who, you know, still of Indian ancestry, but somebody who's Catholic, uh, maybe you know, even a, a contributing French citizen. So the French will look to convert to Indians, but whereas the Spanish missionaries, again, their success was somewhat limited. They, they worked sometimes, it, it worked, uh, didn't work other times. French missionaries are going to have almost no success. You know, again, maybe maybe they could argue against that, but when compared even to the Spanish, they're going to have limited success. So uh, basically, French missionaries will come in, they'll find a local Indian group, and they'll say, all right, guys, I have cool stuff. I have pots, I have knives. Come into my mission, give up your way of life, start growing my food. Well, we already talked about the reasons why Indian groups might refuse to do that. But the French missionaries are going to have this problem the Spanish don't have, is the Indians, I don't n need to get these goods from you. I can just kill this animal and get them from that guy down down the river. They, The thing that uh, had enticed some Indians into Spanish missions will not be there to entice uh, these French uh, Indians, these Indians into French missions. Uh, and not only that, but a lot of Indians are going to look at these French missionaries and say, wait, you want me to become like you? Well, that guy down the river married my sister. He's becoming like me. So that's kind of going to be a, a thing. They're going to have to deal with these fur traders that go native, uh, sort of discouraging Indians from entering fish, French missions. Again, there'll be a handful of French missions set up in, in Canada and in, in what today the United States will be successful. But for the most part, um, you know, th these things are going to be limited in their success. So that's going to be a group that's going to come along with uh, the fur traders. Another group that will come along with the fur traders is soldiers. So as the French uh, continue to expand into the interior, uh, they're going to need people to protect the fur trading posts. Like, say, local Indians maybe get upset about prices um, You know, the French are offering, decide to attack a fur trading post. Well, the French want to make sure they have soldiers nearby to defend the fur traders. And as we're going to talk about, when the English start getting close to French territory, you know, to ensure the French control their land, uh, the French uh, king will send soldiers to sort of set up these posts. So, you know, this big area here, this isn't all fur traders. There's a handful of mer uh, missionaries. There's a handful of uh, soldiers and forts throughout this region as well. And I um, should also point out, again, there is some agriculture that's going to be uh, developed back here, Quebec, Montreal. It's not here on this map, but you also see these French Acadians start setting up in this place, Nova Scotia over here to, um, uh, you know, uh, farmers and what these farmers would do is they would, uh, you know, s provide the surplus grain down here to be sent to these these places in the interior. All right, so this is French settlement of Canada, and this is basically where the French are at by 1680. Okay, well, something's going to happen from 1680 to 1682. Well, let's say it's going to lead to a massive expansion in where the French live in what's today the United States. What's going to happen is this guy, okay? This guy is named Robert LaSalle. You uh, don't need to know much about Robert LaSalle except for what you can basically see 
in this picture. LaSalle was a, the type of guy who would spend a lot of time on his hair. You know, this is a person that is incredibly vain. From all we know about Robert LaSalle, he really liked him some Robert LaSalle, and he wasn't a very efficient leader. You know, he would sort of, uh, you know, exaggerate his own self-importance, things like that. Uh, so Robert LaSalle was sort of a vain guy, not the best leader, but he was a good explorer. So what Robert LaSalle's job was is he was basically a vanguard for fur trading companies. And I'm sort of putting Robert LaSalle in a box here. He's a little bit more than this, but to, to keep things simple, what Robert LaSalle would do is whenever the fur in an area started to run out, what Robert LaSalle would do is he would explore, say, down a river and find the next group of friendly Indians where there's beaver fur in abundance. And he would basically tell the fur traders at the previous post, hey, just move down here. There's a great group of Indians down here. There's a great fur trading post. And he would sort of serve as this explorer for these fur traders. So he would draw the maps of the rivers and, you know, report back. And, and that's sort of how he's going to make his money. So that's what Robert LaSalle had been doing in the late 1600s, is he had been exploring these various rivers to find resources on them, particularly fur, uh, to, to expand this fur trading empire. Well, Robert LaSalle is doing this in uh, 1670s. Well, 1680, he's going to start to note that, man, many of these uh, rivers that I've been exploring, they funnel into a single river. And in 1680, Robert LaSalle is going to determine that he wants to explore to see where this powerful river, the Mississippi River, where it goes. So he's going to get together a small expedition in 1680, and he's going to explore the Mississippi River to its end. So he and a couple of his followers are going to sail down here, and they're going to arrive at the end of the Mississippi. Now, when they get down to this Mississippi, it's kind of interesting because they're going to be some of the first Europeans to see this Mississippi culture uh, since really since, um, uh, let's see, DeSoto, really since DeSoto. And, and what Robert LaSalle is going to see, he's going to be incredibly impressed by. He's going to find these huge mound cities, but the mounds, you know, they're not being built lately because uh, the uh, population been dramatically reduced over the course of years uh, with the... Uh, uh, the onset of diseases, but he still finds large cities among the Mississippi culture Indian cities in the thousands, things like that, because he, um, uh, you know, again, because even after disease, that area is so densely populated, uh, even if you eliminate 80% of the people, you're still going to have large populations. So he's going to be really impressed by the, the local Indians in this uh, southern Mississippi area, or this uh, Mississippi Gulf area, I guess, or Delta area, um, uh, these Mississippi culture groups. Again, not as impressed as DeSoto because owing to disease, they're, they're not the same level they were when, when he came through. But LaSalle's going to basically say, man, these guys would make great allies. They seem like they're, you know, agricultural. It seems like they have their stuff together. And he's going to say these make great trading partners. Now, he's not going to be as high on the fur in the area. Um, there's uh, uh, fur in the area. It's uh, when you get warmer regions, which is, you know, lower Louisiana is very warm. The animals have more spread out fur because they don't need to trap the heat in their body. So he's going to see some deer, things like that. Maybe we can make a little bit of money off this fur. We don't have the good, good stuff up in Canada. But he's saying, you know, there is some fur. He sees a... Uh, you know, some buffalo, these eastern buffalo, maybe we can make something out of their manes. So he thinks that we can make money off trade with locals here. He also thinks, even better, we can make trade from the fur trading posts up here. So what had got happened by 1680 is, um, is it had become extremely difficult to ship fur um, all the way back to Quebec. You're going upriver a lot of the way, and it's difficult simply to go that direction. Well, LaSalle realizes that if I go down this Mississippi, I can just throw the fur in a raft, and it gets down here really quick. And he makes the connection that he's just come out in the Gulf. And as a matter of fact, he stops around the area that's today New Orleans, and he looks out and he says, this would be a perfect place, not just for a fur trading post, but for an entire colony. 
So we got to get a lot of people down here, and then we can make money through trade here. We can load our, our ships up, and we can get our furs from up here uh, to Europe much quicker than we could going back up through Quebec. So he's already thinking how to make money off the fur trade, you know, local fur trade. Not as good as the fur up here, but we can get the fur up here, down here a lot quicker into Europe, a lot quicker than going this direction. <clears throat> so LaSalle thinks he should form a colony right here. Not only does he think that this would be good for trade, he's going to realize not too far from here, the Spanish have got these huge silver mines. You know, what we could maybe do is eventually if this grows big enough, we can lead armies down there and take the silver mines from them. But even if we can't, what we can do is if we if we take this river and we have a, a colony, we can defend this river fairly easily and we can just launch pirating vessels out of the river. We can come back up whenever the Spanish pursue us, hide here, and we have a good defense of cannons, things like that. The, the Spanish won't be able to get to us. Uh, so we basically have a good trading location, a good pirating location, and if we get big enough, perhaps a good enough uh, area to, to invade Spanish territory. So for these various reasons, LaSalle is going to claim all of the lands or all of the water in the Mississippi and all the uh, rivers flowing into the Mississippi and all lands touching these rivers in the name of France. It's something Europeans would do at the time. They would find a body of water and they would claim this, uh, this body of water and all the lands touching the body of water in the name of their monarch. LaSalle does that when he reaches the end of Mississippi and says, this land is now for France. King of France at the time was named King Louis. There's a million different French kings named King Louis. And so he calls this area Louisiana. So the Mississippi, all rivers flowing into the Mississippi and all land touching these rivers is now property of King Louis. We're calling it Louisiana. So again, you know, whenever you see a French name, St. Louis, whatever, uh, the, the, a lot of these things are going to be named after um, the various King Louis. Um, in order to stake his claim he's going to uh, put up this post and basically mark that this is French territory and he's going to pack up his men and he's going to sail back up to the Mississippi and he's going to then head over to France and he's going to consult with the French king he's going to say to the French king dude I've got this perfect spot for a settlement you know it, it's straight down from the places we already got in Canada if we settle down here, locals seem like they're really cool. We can trade with them. Um, not only that, but we'll have a perfect place to launch pirate raids against the Spanish. And if we get big enough, uh, we can we can even take over Spanish uh, silver mines in northern Mexico. Can I please have permission to settle at the end of this Mississippi River? Well, a king, sure, sounds good to me. He's going to furnish uh, LaSalle, give him three ships. He's going to get together 300 settlers. This is going to include women and children because they want to make this thing permanent. And in 1684, end of 1684, beginning of 1685, LaSalle is going to take off intending to land at the end of the Mississippi River. So he takes off and he's heading here for New Orleans. Unfortunately for LaSalle, the Mississippi doesn't doesn't end in a gulf. Most rivers end in gulfs, like they are end in, in bays. So you have an end of a river, there's usually these little uh, areas where sort of the water spills out. And you can tell where there's a river because there, there's this widening of, of where uh, it comes out, uh, where the water comes out. Mississippi River isn't like that. It's basically just sort of a bunch of swamps and just sort of, you know, just spreads out. So you can't see the river from the coast. Well, LaSalle doesn't see a bay, which is kind of crazy because he was just there a little bit before, but he passes by there and he's sort of like, no, nope, that's not it. I think it's still west. You know, maybe he's reading bad map, you know, but again, he put together his own maps, but he's going to skip past the Mississippi and he's going to cruise to the coast of what's today, Texas. Um, and again, nobody in Texas, the Spanish haven't gone to Texas. It's uh, nobody been here really since... Uh, uh, Cabeza de Vaca or maybe a handful of DeSoto's men made it close to this region but uh, he reaches the Gulf Coast of Texas 
looks at it and says, I think this is the end of the Mississippi. It's not the end of the Mississippi. He's hundreds of miles away. But LaSalle mistakenly believes he's at the end of the Mississippi, offloads his ship, offloads his settlers. They're going to send one of the ships back to France, and they're going to sort of just be chilling there with these other ships while LaSalle and his people build a fort. They're going to call this fort Fort St. Louis, again, named after King Louis. They don't realize how close they are to Spanish territory. Um, um, and again, they think they're all the way over here. Uh, LaSalle basically thinks the Mississippi is, is just right next door. Well, they build this 1685. Um, their, their ships actually run aground, so they're sort of going to be stuck here. But they're not thinking that's a big deal because, hey, we're going to have fur trading boats coming down the Mississippi soon. So whatever, we can get up to Kent if we need to. We'll just sail up the river to the Mississippi or up the river, uh, up Mississippi River. Well, no boats come down, and sort of LaSalle and his people start looking around, and they start exploring the area, and some of the people that had gone with LaSalle on his first expedition would be like, hey, dude, you know, when we came down here a couple years before, you know, there's swamps and stuff everywhere. Now, there's just a bunch of plains everywhere around us. There's, uh, the Indians aren't those densely packed guys in big cities. As a matter of fact, these dudes... They just run around all over the place. They're hunter-gatherers, and they're kind of mean, you know. And some people are going to say to LaSalle, dude, I think you settled us in the wrong spot. And LaSalle initially, no, nah, you guys are idiots. We're, we're right by it. If, if we're not at the Mississippi, it, it's just a little bit away. And so they explore the local area, 1685. Eventually you're going to realize, crap, we settled in the wrong place. No help is coming down the river. Uh, you know, the boats we had with us, they ran aground. So no help is going to be coming for us. Well, they're going to be living there 1685, 1686. During this time, their supplies are going to quickly run out. The local hunter-gatherer Indians are going to be attacking them whenever they leave the settlement. They're going to try planting crops, but they're going to fail. By 1687, uh, less than 100 of the original settlers are left at Fort St. Louis. And it's at this point that LaSalle and his men are going to decide if we're going to survive, we got to walk back to Canada. We don't know where we're at, but we know Canada's north. And so LaSalle and his men are going to take off in 1687. They're going to leave behind a handful of, of settlers, mostly uh, the women and children uh, in this fort. And LaSalle and the surviving men will take off in order to walk back to Canada. Well, somewhere, probably somewhere in, today in East Texas, LaSalle's men are going to be looking around and they're going to say, Dude, LaSalle sucks, man. He landed us in the wrong area. Look at his hair. This guy spends too much time on his hair. He's annoying. He, you want to kill him? Yeah, I think I want to kill him. His men get fed up with him, and somewhere in East Texas, they're going to decide to murder LaSalle. Boom, boom, boom. There's a lot of uh, depictions of LaSalle being murdered on the Internet. If you ever get curious, you can find more than those three. I don't know why that's the case, but apparently... Uh, People like drawing LaSalle get murdered. So he dies in East Texas. It's actually kind of interesting because some of his men do make it back to Canada. That's how we know about this, uh, what happens. Um, the people that he left behind at Fort St. Louis, uh, local uh, hunter-gatherer Indians, will eventually kill them. Um, uh, some will actually be captured and incorporated into local tribes. But LaSalle dies, and his settlement falls apart, uh, killed by local Indians. So why are we talking about this guy? What, you know, what doesn't seem like anything came of him? Well, something will come out of him, uh, come from him. Basically, his idea failed, but the French are going to realize LaSalle sucks. His thing didn't work, but man, he had a really good idea with this settling at the end of the Mississippi. So shortly after the failure of LaSalle's colony, the French are going to send other expeditions, and they're just going to start populating uh, this lower Mississippi left and right. This, this basically this area here, and they're going to start using this initially for the purpose of trading down there. Uh, and and you know, as we're going to talk about in a second here, you know, uh, uh, potentially for piracy, local trade with Indians, things like that. So that's one thing, and we're going to come back and talk about that more in a second. He's also going to have effect because local Indians will report to the Spanish, hey, what are those dudes that kind of look like you with the white skin and the, and the beards? What are they doing up here? Spanish, you know, up here, you know, there's silver settlements and stuff here. They learn about it. They're going to send a series of expeditions to look for LaSalle, uh, and they're going to decide, 
we've got to settle here because it seems like the French are about to come down and settle this region. So as we'll talk about in a second, it's going to lead to Spanish settlement of Texas. But let's first focus on this French Louisiana. So the French start settling at the end of the Mississippi, and again they start settling for the purpose of maybe creating a pirate base for um, uh, to to attack Spanish shipping, uh, the, for trade coming down from Canada, well, and, and to trade with local Indians. Well, the pirate thing isn't going to end up working. It's beyond what we're we're going to be talking about in this class. But just at the beginning of the 1700s, the French and Spanish king they actually it gets weird European politics things, but their families actually kind of, they don't merge, but they marry one another. And we'll see French, France and Spain from the 1700s on, they're not going to love one another, but they're not going to be at each other's throats all the time. I mean, they'll occasionally go to war with one another, but you'll have much friendlier relations after the 1700s. So the idea of uh, using this Louisiana to pirate Spanish shipping that will go to the wayside, but the um, French in Louisiana will do the trading with local Indians. Now, that's not going to be a big deal again because the fur is not that great. But this Louisiana area will become a hub for trade coming down from Canada. So we send fur down from Canada, and then we're going to load it onto ships and send it back to Europe. And in addition, the French, when they settle down here, they're going to find this area is really good for growing certain crops. Like So the British at this point are shipping out tobacco, rice from their colonies on the su southern coast of uh, uh, the Atlantic. The French are going to say that stuff grows here as well. So almost immediately the French are going to abandon their plans to use this area as a pirate base, but they'll start to use it instead for agriculture. And what we'll see the French do is basically the same thing that the English do they're going to start actually importing African slaves to this region, just like the uh, English that started importing African slaves to their southern colonies. So we'll have these slaves start arriving on these ships to these French settlements. And uh, at the time, the French will actually start grabbing some uh, territories from Spain and the Caribbean, shipping slaves there as well. So what starts happening in Louisiana is going to be different than the colonies up in Canada. Those are just a handful of fur traders in these outposts. Instead, you're going to see this agricultural community develop, African slaves introduced, some trade with local Indians, uh, and then again, some trade from coming uh, down uh, the river. And uh, this would be early French settlers clearing out the forest and, and building the, uh, these homes. This right here, I, I think this is incredibly interesting. So this is a picture done of New Orleans. 17, 18, 19, 20, right after it was founded. And I think this is a good representation of how French Louisiana is going to work. So this is a, a part of this drawing. And, and what you'll see here is you know, trees have been cleared out. This is where these French uh, settlers would live. And what you have here, right here, is a small boat. I'm betting this came down from the Mississippi. And what happened is it was loaded up with fur. And uh, they unloaded the fur. And then what happens a lot of times with these small boats, because it's kind of hard to go up the Mississippi, you're going against gravity, um, a lot of times you just take apart these small boats. They just destroy them, use them as firewood. Sometimes they would send them back up the river. But the fur gets offloaded, then it gets loaded up on these big ships uh, now at the end of the Mississippi, and these big ships will go back to France. So small boats coming down from Canada, Illinois, you know, uh, places like that then it's going to be loaded onto these big ships, and then they're the ones that go back to France. So that's part of the character of uh, uh, New Orleans. Another thing you'll sort of see here is uh, th this uh, trees being cleared out, so they've been chopped down, being burned. This might be a small boat that had come down from Canada. That might be what that's representing. Uh, these guys, these are African slaves being forced to uh, cut off these, um, uh, cut down these trees. Again, the French start importing African slaves just like the English did in their, their southern colonies. This guy, he's doing something with an alligator. I don't know if he's poking the alligator, if he's use, pulling it on a leash. Whatever it is, it's badass. But um, that's obviously a part of Louisiana history of these crazy uh, alligators. So this is uh, 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 half of that picture. This is the other half of the picture, and I think this also... Uh, shows some representation. So you'll see actually in, in the background some of these uh, homes have um, uh, uh, crosses on them. And this is Catholic. These Catholic churches the French are going to bring in. 
Another thing that's going to be an important part of the economy in Louisiana is, again, trade with the local Mississippi culture Indians. That's actually represented here in this picture because uh, this would be a um, local Indian tribe. This is actually the Creeks, and we know this is the Creeks because there was one group of Creeks called the Red Stick Creeks, and this uh, Red Stick, uh, whenever they would come into town to trade, they would have the Red Stick on the front of their boats. So these guys are probably coming in to, to trade something with the French uh, and you so you got these red stick creeks and it's kind of interesting because if you look at Louisiana today you know the French when they're putting down the maps they would put all right this is where this local group lives and the second biggest city in, in Louisiana Baton Rouge in French that means red stick for red stick creek so you kind of see that in this image so the French now settle Louisiana I the, th the problem with this is they're going to be making a lot of money from this uh, uh, shipment of furs down from Canada. And the agriculture, particularly the tobacco and rice, are going to produce. It's going to be in high demand back in Europe. But the French, French Louisiana is not going to grow very quickly. So it starts being settled, 1699, 1700. But the population is going to grow slowly. And in part, this is because this area is in incredibly disease ridden you have stagnant water which allows for mosquito growth and so a lot of the French that come over here particularly those from cold weather areas that never gotten malaria uh, before and don't have any natural or inherited or acquired immunities to these diseases a lot of them are going to die in droves here in Louisiana as a matter of fact the French realize how important Louisiana is to to maintain we, we need to keep this place running so they know they need a population there so what they would start doing is shipping convicts. Uh, well, the French took a census. I think they shipped convicts, and my numbers might be off here, but in 1720, they sent 2,000 convicts to Louisiana, and basically, you know, instead of being in jail, you're just going to become a colonist in Louisiana. They did a census 10 years later, and only 60 of those guys were left alive. The rest had uh, died of disease. So the French settlement of Louisiana is going to be similar in some ways to the English, but it's not going to grow as rapidly as the English uh, 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 on the coast of the Atlantic. Again, they're dying of disease over there as well, but not as uh, as much as we'll see here in the French uh, Louisiana. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, another reason the French aren't going to pay as much attention to Louisiana as maybe they, they would have in a different scenario is because the French... Um, they actually acquired some of these Caribbean uh, islands and areas from Spain. As Spain starts declining for a variety of different reasons we've already talked about, poor spending, things like that. Um, essentially, they lose a series of wars to England and France uh, and sign over certain territories. The French are actually going to acquire this Haiti and a handful of sugar islands over here from Spain. And when they acquire this, they're going to start focusing on, on uh, building sugar plantations here. So, you know, sure, we like the tobacco rice produced up in Louisiana, but, um, you know, we can produce sugar here in Haiti. Let's ship our slaves here, you know, and only a portion of the slaves go up there. And so as we're going to talk about later, the French, they value Louisiana, but they're going to value their Caribbean island, new Caribbean island possessions even more. All right, so the French are now in Louisiana. What does this mean? Well, the Spanish, as we talked about, this is going to scare the heck out of them because uh, before this point, they um, nobody had been up here, but now that the French are here, the Spanish had ignored Texas to this point, these hunter-gatherer Indians. Um, again, some of them had acquired the horse and made it rough to expand, and as we talked about, from 1607, they hadn't made any really inroads east, in part because they didn't need to. They had these silver mines down here. But when the French start showing up, the Spanish are going to say, crap, we need to settle and create a buffer between us and these new French settlers. So right after they learn about La Salle, the Spanish will start setting up missions among some of these poor Indian groups here in Texas. Uh, you'll see initially they try in East Texas. Um, among some of the Mississippi culture Indians, but they don't want any part of the Spanish. We're doing fine on our own. Uh, and so the Spanish will end up sending, setting up missions among the hunter-gatherers in San Antonio, uh, a couple along the coast of, um, of uh, uh, the Atlantic coast. And what's going to happen is, uh, or the uh, Gulf of Mexico, 
And what's going to happen is, you know, some of these poor tribes will accept these uh, life and these missions. Spanish will send some soldiers up here. But they're not going to pay a lot of attention to Texas. Sorry, Texas people, because there's not any minerals there. They really only uh, populate it because they don't want the French to get close to their silver mines. And so the Spanish start settling Texas end of the 1600s, right when the Spanish or the French are settling Louisiana. But it's sort of an afterthought. The um, only thing we really see in Texas that, it, you know, is a couple thousand people, some mission Indians, some missionaries, a handful of soldiers, and a handful of civilians that realize that, hey, these cattle grow really well on the plains. We're, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, raise cattle, and then we'll ship them down uh, for, to the market in those silver mines, and, and that's how we'll make money. So we see the Spanish settle Texas as a result of the French settlement of Louisiana. This isn't the only effect uh, that the French settlement of Louisiana will have. Uh, so the Spanish settled in this region. The English, up to this point, had not settled in Georgia. But now they look and they're saying, oh, the French are over here. And the Spanish, by the way, they also start paying more attention to the western part of Florida. The English start looking around and saying, oh, well, this, this area might be in play now. So they're going to establish a military colony of Georgia in 1732, basically send a governor over and say, make sure the French don't, don't attack the rest of our colonies and make sure the Spanish sort of stay away as well. So French landing and start settling in lower Louisiana brings areas into play that hadn't been in play before. And it's also going to have an effect on these local Indian groups, okay? So as we just talked about, these Mississippi culture Indians in this particular area, much reduced from where they were when Europeans arrived just because of uh, disease had gone through in multiple waves. Well, now they're going to find themselves at the beginning of the 1700s surrounded by all these Europeans. That seems like it would be scary, and your first reaction might be, this is bad news for them. It's actually going to be great for the Mississippi culture groups. Maybe not great isn't the right word, but it's they're going to find a way to make this 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 work okay so if you have the English over here the Spanish over here the French over here and you're again fairly populous um, tens of thousands of you guys uh, at, at this point at least um, and you've got these guys around you how can you sort of use this to your advantage well what these various groups will start doing is they'll start playing the European powers off of one another so they'll now have the French to trade with they'll now have the, the English to trade with uh, they'll have the Spanish to trade with, and um, and what's going to happen is they will start to basically say, all right, if you start pushing in on our territory here, we're going to go to the French and we're going to say, hey, these guys are going to be right up next to you unless you give us some guns to defend ourselves. And so the French will supply groups like the Cherokees, other Mississippi groups like the Creeks, with weapons to better resist the English. Same thing. English are going to uh, move closer to you unless you give us guns. Okay, good deal. Or maybe Chickasaws, all right, I'm going to bring some furs down here to the French, trade with them. Well, I'm not, you're not going to give you a good deal for these furs. Well, fine, I'm just going to go over to the English, and I'll get the deal from them if you don't trade with me. All right, fine, here's this good deal. And we're going to see these guys do a very good job of playing these powers off one another. And what's actually going to start to happen, this is going to get these various groups to uh, start to learn how to deal with these Europeans better than other Indian groups. Um, so a lot of these various groups will learn English. A lot of members will. A lot of they'll learn French. Some will learn Spanish. Some will start marrying into um, uh, marrying some of the traders from these various nations. And what you're actually going to see at the beginning of the 1700s is through close proximity of these groups, a lot of these Mississippi culture Indians will become Europeanized. So you'll have European traders move in with them. Some of them will start learning English, Spanish, French, and they're going to start adopting European clothing because they're going to be so much trading with the French, Spanish, and, and uh, the English. And so uh, you'll see in, in these Mississippi culture areas, houses built in European style, European clothing start to be worn. I believe this is a, a depiction of a, a Choctaw uh, village. I could be wrong. Uh, but you'll see them start growing European style crops. And they're going to start learning to deal with the Europeans better uh, than, than other Indian groups will. And again, 
this is going to give them opportunities that you wouldn't have had. Like groups like the Palatins wouldn't have had. The Palatins didn't have a European power to play off of them, uh, but these groups will, you know, and it's going to sort of change them. As a matter of fact, the the Cherokees are going to go as far to realize that one of the things these guys have this advantage over us is riding. You'll see a Cherokee guy develop a Cherokee writing system. He'll basically uh, uh, convert the Cherokee spoken language into writing to help Cherokees communicate with one another better to deal with these various European powers. So the introduction of the French uh, changes the game, and now we're going to see North America that previously hadn't been, uh, you know, it, these Euro various European powers had been separated. Now they're going to be close together. And what we're about to see is n what's going to happen when you start seeing these guys get closer to one another. And what's going to happen is in the mid-1700s, we're going to have a major conflict for the future of North America. And that's what we're going to talk about next time.